Hello, everyone. Welcome to Time with Pastor Otabel, our interactive discussion program that gives scriptural perspective on the most relevant issues of our lives. My name is Kajam Masari Jr., welcoming you on behalf of Dr. and Mrs. Otabel. So last week, we started this expedition of the Easter story. Today, we shall continue on that same path with specific emphasis on the events that happened in the life of Christ from his death through to his ascension. Leading the discussion, as always, it is my joy and honor to welcome Dr. Mensah Otabel. Thank you, and it's good to see you. Good to see you too. Last week was very insightful. My all-time takeaway was the exposition on the Holy Communion. Amen. It was a blessing to me. Amen. Welcome in my colleague pastors, Pastor Eric Emeku. Pastor Eric, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Pastor Kojo. And Pastor Prisla Nanketia. Pastor Prisla, good to yeah. see you. Good to see you too. You're Thank looking you. good. Doc, was it really necessary for Jesus to have died? And if it, it was, why there's such a cruel death, particularly on the cross? Um, all the activities leading to Christ's coming, the prophecies, the rituals, the ceremonies, foreshadowing him, the types in the Old Testament, uh, portrayed that the sins of mankind had to be paid for uh, because the wages of sin was death. And to symbolize that, animals died. And they didn't die natural deaths, but they were put to death in a way that caused pain to the animals. Uh, but all of those were foreshadowing uh, the ultimate fulfillment of the need for the sins of mankind to be forgiven. And Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God who came for that purpose. So uh, Jesus Christ himself knew that his mission entailed are suffering for the sins of mankind, not for his own sins. Uh, and so, yes, it, it was necessary because right in the Garden of Eden, God had said to uh, our first parents, the day that you would disobey, you shall surely die. Uh, death was the consequence for sin. And, and that's why Jesus Christ uh, had to come in and die. But that death, was it talking about spiritual death or physical death? Well, I, I think if you were Adam, uh, you would see death as death. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, later on we get to know that there are aspects of death. There is spiritual death and then there is physical death and there is eternal death. But all of it are degrees of death and Christ came to deal with all of it. Uh, physical the death, uh, spiritual death and eternal death. But shall it be that cruel and also on the cross? It shows the severity of sin and its consequences. That sin is not an, an easy thing. Uh, even now in many parts of the world, some kinds of wrongs are punishable by death. Uh, so sin is a very cruel activity uh, and sometimes it exacts uh, cruel judgment and punishment. And Jesus had to take on the sin of the entire world. And the sin of the entire world is it's quite a lot of uh, bad deeds that uh, people are capable of doing from uh, all kinds of sins you can imagine. So that is the price he had to pay. So the, the suffering he suffered was measured according to the sin that he was uh, paying for. Mm. But why on the cross? The, the Jewish uh, law had uh, prescribed that a person who dies on a tree was cursed and, and was receiving the curse of, of mankind. And Jesus, uh, in addition to paying for the sins of the world, was absorbing all the curses of humanity upon himself. And the cross was a symbol of it. Okay, thank you. Doc, it's, it's clear that the Jews and the Pharisees were bent on killing Jesus. Well, prophecy was fulfilled, was their desire to kill him motivated by religious or political considerations? Uh, you know, God uses the, the events of history to work out his plan. 
So for the Jews, their problem with Jesus would be that he was upstaging them, um, especially the Jewish leaders. And he had a large following and he was teaching things that were a little different from how they practiced their religion. Um, and so, yes, there was anger uh, and frustration with him, but the, the purpose of God was bigger than their anger. So you can say that their anger fed into the plan of God, but God was working out his purpose to, to get Christ to do for us what only he could have done to pay for our sins. So uh, it took a natural process of the hatred of the people, but the hand of God was, was behind it. And, and it just, it's a very instructive uh, idea to also know that Many times when we think this is just human beings doing something, God may be using the activities to work out his purposes. Right. Doc, what's this, uh, the significance of the seven statements that Jesus Christ made on the cross before his death? Um, I mean, each of those statements, I believe, uh, was speaking to something specific from when he said, Father, forgive them, to when he said it is finished, or... Uh, gave up his spirit, depending on which one you think it came first. Uh, but those statements were all addressing uh, specific ideas of forgiveness, of the promise of paradise or the promise of salvation. Uh, he was talking about uh, separation from, from God at the point when he's carrying the sins of the world. He's talking about responsibility uh, to, to, to people we live behind when we are departing, uh, that we have to be mindful uh, to leave people prepared, you know, and, and taken care of, and don't just take off and, uh, and, and leave people unattended to. And so we see that with his mother and John. And, and then we see the other statements, which are all prophetic, uh, because he was just literally quoting scripture uh, in most of the statements he was making. Um, and then his death. So, I mean, you can look at all the seven and draw lessons from, from each one of them. I think what has been very instructive is when he handed over his mother to John, which yeah. we just opened up eyes to. Yes, I mean, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a very tender, intimate side of Jesus. You know, we, we just see Jesus as messianic, larger than life, a human being, not bothered about anything in this world, obeying and doing his spiritual duty. But then at that moment, uh, we see the tenderness because every time we look at Jesus and his mother, uh, right from the early interactions of when the mother wanted him to uh, help at the wedding feast, uh, you get the impression as if Jesus is not too attached to, to her. Uh, and, and then when he's asked about who is my mother, uh, his mother and, and brothers are looking for him. He says, who is my mother? Uh, everybody who does my will. So then as you follow the story, if you're not careful, you can just say Jesus is very aloof. He does have his mother. He just wants to fulfill his mission. And that's it. His mother was not important. But at that moment, you just see the, the, the important role that this chosen woman place in the life of Jesus Christ. And, and he addresses her and, and, and commits her to, to a safe care, uh, to a trusted disciple. And I, I think it's a very uh, tender and intimate image we have of Jesus, the human, uh, not Jesus God, but Jesus the human, caring for his human relationships. Very important. But why did he commit him to the hands of John in particular? There's no scriptural reason for it. We can assume a reason that John uh, was supposed to be one of the youngest of the disciples of Jesus. And uh, also just looking at his writings uh, seems also to be a very particularly caring person. Uh, he spoke a lot about love. Uh, and, and so probably something about John's nature uh, endeared him to Jesus, enough for Jesus to commit his mother to. But then, I mean, practically, he was the only one there. Yeah, <laughs> Peter right. was not there. The rest were not there. So in a practical sense, 
he was the one there and they, and they were standing together. Doc, in Luke 23, 34, Jesus prayed on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Was that prayer for the soldiers or for humanity? Because in any case, it was our sins that took him to the cross. Uh, there's a big debate as to whom Jesus said that to. Uh, but as you read the narrative, it indicates that when they were nailing uh, his hand, he made that statement. And, and it, it's possible he made it more than once, th that he said it more than once, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Uh, I think Jesus was addressing all those who partook of the activities leading to his death, uh, including Judas and the priests and the chief priests and the Roman soldiers, everybody who was physically and materially culpable in what happened to him, I believe that's what he was addressing. And, and, and that's why I believe that in that larger picture, uh, Judas could have received forgiveness because Jesus had offered it to everybody who had played a role in his death. But you can also expand it to say that he was saying that for the entire world which I don't really believe that's what he was doing, uh, but it can be implied, but I don't think that's, that's what he was doing. I think that what he did for the world was what he was doing on the cross, but that pronouncement, specific one, was to absolve those who were directly responsible for his death. In John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus' words, it is finished. Was it at that point that his redemptive work was completed, or his resurrection, ascension, or the coming of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> <laughs> These are very interesting theological arguments. I mean, they're, they're, people have all kinds of uh, positions on it. At what point uh, the plan of redemption was completed, and when Jesus said, it is finished, what did he mean? Uh, although Jesus spoke in Aramaic, most of the time, which was the common language for the Jews of his time, uh, the New Testament record of Jesus is in Greek. Although he spoke in Aramaic, God chose the Greek language to express the thought he wanted us to have of him. Uh, so the, the word that is used in the Greek language uh, is not the Aramaic, it's the Greek, and it's a transactional word. And when we say transactional, uh, so when Jesus says it is finished, he doesn't mean that a process is uh, finished. It's, it's like I have finished a race in that sense. That's not exactly what he's saying, or um, I have finished doing something. But that word is transaction. It's a business statement. That means it is paid in full. So for, for us English readers, when we read it is finished, we may think of somebody who is doing a work and has finished it. Uh, there, there is a sense in that. But if you look at it, it, there is a sense it is finished. Then you may conclude that when he said it is finished, everything has been finished. But then if you look at it in its original Greek, it doesn't mean everything has been finished. It means everything has been paid for. But when you pay for something, it has to be received by the one you are paying it to. So it's, it's like I come to a transaction, I have the money uh, to pay for something, I give you the money, it's paid for, but you have to receive it and give me a receipt that the transaction has been completed. So in that sense, he has paid for it, but the process was still continuing uh, because he had to go and present what he has paid for to the one he was paying it to, to God, the father and the father has to accept it and then he has to be settled and at which point you say the transaction is completed but he said it is paid for it is finished it has been paid for i've paid for it and his death paid for it and but isn't it interesting that jesus didn't say i am finished uh, that that means i'm ended this is the end of my life but it is so at all material times, Jesus knew that what was happening on the cross was not about him. It was about something else he was settling. And that's what he meant 
by saying it is paid for, paid in full. The transaction has been paid in full, but it wasn't the end of the process. So it is finished, uh, but he had to die. He had to uh, resurrect and he had to uh, present himself and he had to be seated at the father's right hand, at which point you would say the whole process has come to a finalization. So that's a total package. It's a total package, yes. It is finished simply means it has been fully paid for and his death paid for it. This is time with Pastor Otabel discussing today the Easter story. We shall take a short break. When we return from the break, Pastor Otabel will help us to understand what it means when the Christian creed said he descended to hell. Please stay tuned. Welcome back from the break. Please call a friend to call a friend to be part of this conversation. It's been insightful. Pastor Eric. The Bible records that Jesus bowed his head and gave up the spirit. The Amplified they used the word voluntarily. Some suggest that Jesus had to willfully die. He did not willfully die. Will it be impossible for death to take Jesus Christ? What, what is the scripture proposition? The Words that are used regarding Jesus' demise uh, is killed. Uh, and, and Jesus Christ himself said it, used it and said he will be killed. Now, when, when you're going to be killed, uh, you don't volunteer death. I mean, it means somebody is actively taking life away from you. Uh, and so Jesus used that to indicate that that was going to happen. And then on the cross, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So there you get the impression that although the people were killing him, he gave up his spirit. So there are two things happening here. What the people are doing to take his life from him and what he did to surrender his life. But ultimately, the death of Jesus was the surrender of his life because he wasn't paying a price to the Romans, neither was he paying a price to the Jews, nor to Satan. Jesus is paying a price to God to satisfy a just requirement for the sins of mankind. And, and the one who has to certify that it has been done is God, uh, God the Father. So when Jesus then says, Father, into your hand I commit my spirit, my view is, although the people tried to kill him, it was the surrender of his life that physically ended his life. Doc, no. yeah. Doc the Bible says that when Jesus Christ died, the graves were opened and those who were, had fallen asleep raised up and they entered to the holy city after his resurrection. Can you share some light on this whole scripture? You are asking some very difficult questions <laughs> today. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, th these are all very um, problematic mm. passages in mm. the Bible mm. that you don't hear people talking about much and explaining much. There, there are a sequence of events uh, first is that the, the curtain in the temple is torn. And the Bible says that it's torn from top to bottom, not from bottom to top. And these are all important notations because if it's human beings tearing it, they, they are at the bottom, they have to tear it from the bottom. But then it's torn from the top, it means there's something 
bigger than a human uh, tears it from the top. So this is a spiritual act or a divine act. So that happens. And then there is an earthquake. And then there is darkness. So all of these things happen. And then there is that statement that the graves are open. Not all graves, but certain graves are open. Um, so the earthquake, uh, it seemed like probably disturbed some burial grounds, either around where they were or probably an, in a Jewish burial ground. But these burial grounds were uh, disturbed and, and the graves were open. Then the passage says that some people came out from the graves and showed themselves uh, to uh, the people in Jerusalem. That's where the problem is uh, because the scripture then says that Jesus is the first fruit from the dead. If Jesus is the first fruit from the dead, then they, they couldn't resurrect before Jesus resurrected. But normally when we read the Bible, you can read a narrative about something and not see the time difference, which is embedded in the narrative, but it's not evident. You, you may not see it. So it may look like it's happening one after the other, but something may happen now and it happen a month later, but it will be almost as if it's happening right after the other. So the general position is that when the earthquake occurred, the graves were open, but nobody came out because Jesus had to resurrect and uh, he resurrected. And in his resurrection, the Old Testament saints, some of those who had lived for God in the Old Testament, who had been buried, also uh, was released from captivity and, uh, and also ascended uh, later on to, to heaven. So uh, that, that is the position um, uh, that, Yes, all these events took place. There are people whose graves were open at the time of the death of Jesus Christ, but they didn't come out from the grave till after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Was it symbolic of Jesus' power to conquer death? Um, I mean, you have to interpret all of that with other scriptures, which also show that Jesus Christ did not just resurrect alone, but he also ascended with other saints, Old Testament saints with him. I don't think it was everybody, but I, I think there were other people who ascended with him. Uh, the Bible doesn't give names clearly. In some Christian traditions, names are given of those who ascended with him, uh, but, but he ascended with a host. It's an area that calls for deep study. Yes, it does. It does. Anyway, so in Matthew chapter 26, verse 12, Jesus mentioned that the woman with the alabaster box anointed him in advance in preparation for his burial. Can you explain the significance of this event and its relation to the burial of Jesus? Um, I mean, Jesus clearly valued what the woman had done. I, I don't think the woman had... Uh, that sense that what she was doing was going to be this profound. But Jesus had it because Jesus understood what was going to happen. He knew everything that was going to happen when he was sitting at that table. Um, and I'm always minded to think of what was on Jesus' mind, sitting at a party, people are laughing, everybody is rejoicing, and you know you're going to die next week. And it's going to be a brutal death, and you're going to be beating and your back is going to be torn and you'll be made a public humiliation. But the people, they have no clue. And you, you know this is what is going to happen. And my thinking is probably Jesus was in a very pensive mood. Maybe he was pondering these uh, activities and maybe Mary noticed that there was something happening to the Lord. And so she wanted to do something to cheer up his spirits, to, to make him happier. Uh, and so he, she goes out, bring this very expensive perfume, pours it on Jesus. And uh, people are upset, but Jesus values it. And she says she's done this in preparation for my death and my burial. 
Uh, so what did he mean by preparation? My thinking is that from then on, Jesus was going to hear the most nasty things said about him. He's going to be taken to judgment. He'll be falsely accused. He'll be beating. People are going to spit on him. People are going to insult him. And the, and the sweetest thing he can smell on himself at this time of his deepest passion would be the fragrance of this woman on him because the extent of the fragrance poured on him from soaked so much into him that it was going to stay with him for a long time. And so throughout the time when he was lonely, he was alone and suffering, he could still smell the fragrance of Mary and still take strength in the love, the devotion that is shown by a follower of his. So I believe that's what he meant, that uh, this was a very noble thing because it was very personal for, for Jesus. You know, because many times when people know you as a helper of people, your personal needs are not taken care of. Um, everybody takes away from you and almost nobody gives to you. And when you read through the New Testament, uh, this is about the only time you see somebody give personally to Jesus, do something to benefit him as a person. I mean, Peter gave his boat for him to preach the gospel. Uh, the young boy gave his bread for him to feed 5,000. And I think it, it ministered very deeply to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just thinking of the woman with the alabaster box herself and not knowing really what she was doing, but yeah. how God can use us if we just allow him to lead us. It was a spontaneous yeah. act, uh, but it was very meaningful and significant. And um, isn't it interesting that on the day of the resurrection, they were going to spice his body. And this is the time when these sweet fragrances will be poured on the dead body because then it changes the aroma, uh, but they go and he's already been taken care of and he's risen. And, and, and Mary sensed that way a week earlier that that's how it's going to turn. It's, it's amazing that uh, Judas still had a problem with that oil being spilled on. He, he certainly did so, because um, I think at that time, uh, that's when the seed for the betrayal was sowed in him. Doc. In our Christian creed, we affirm that he, had, he descended into hell, but there, is, there isn't much teaching on that. Can you explain the significance of Christ's work in hell and why the word descended? Yeah. Well, the, the, the language of descend and ascend is very present uh, in the uh, Bible. I mean, you, you see through Old Testament and New Testament, and Jesus Christ himself said that he had descended from the Father, he had come from the Father. So, I mean, if you look at that language, then it may seem to you as if heaven is up, uh, hell is down. Uh, but these are not geographical statements. These are figurative statements. Ascended a place, is, is a place of honor, elevation. Descended is a place of dishonor uh, and disgrace. So we, we have to look at it uh, from a figurative point of view not from a geographical location point of view. Um, the phrase, he descended to hell, uh, we, we have to also then, because, you know, hell is, there is no lake of fire, hell. Uh, hell is the place of the dead, Hades. So when, the, when we say he descended to hell, we simply, I mean, in common man's term, he was in the grave. That's all it means. He was lowered into a grave. That's it. So um, you, you can look at other things that happens while Jesus was dead. But in the creed, he descended to hell simply means he was laid in a grave. But there isn't much teaching on it in terms of... Well, I mean, when you read through the New Testament, you see that a lot of things happened in the period between Jesus' saying it is finished and 
committing his spirit to the Father, and resurrection. I mean, just from the Gospels, you don't see anything beyond that. Uh, he, he's dead, he's buried, and then he resurrects. But from the epistles, then you begin to see the thinking and, and, the, and the ideas of what happened from the cross through the grave to the resurrection. So uh, all that body of knowledge is there, some of it in, in Paul's writings, some in, in Peter's writings. Uh, you find these thoughts there. Doc, um, let's stay with Jesus a little bit in hell. First Peter chapter 3, verse 19 says that when he went to hell, he preached to the spirits in prison. Did Jesus really preach in hell? Well, that's what the, the passage says. <laughs> so then we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean that he preached to the spirits in hell? I mean, there, there are different schools of thought. Some people believe that these are Old Testament people who denied God, especially those who died in the flood, who needed to be given the chance of repentance. And for them, Jesus presented himself as the Messiah for them to believe in. Uh, and, and, and so that, that, that's one school of thought. Uh, some believe that this is for to angels who rebelled. I, I don't hold that view at all in any form uh, because I, I, the death of Jesus Christ was not for the angelic order. It was for human beings. He's the son of man uh, who came to die for us. Most of these thoughts in the Bible uh, require a lot of uh, thinking through to really determine what they mean. I have my own positions on them. And normally when I'm dealing with things of this nature, I, I need to take my time to express it uh, as clearly as I see it. I believe that Jesus gave those who had died in the past without any recourse of redemption, uh, probably gave them the chance to examine him and what he has done and gave them the opportunity for salvation. So is there a place of repentance after death? Before Christ is very different from after Christ. He came in and he's paid the price. There's not going to be another Jesus to come and die and go and preach to people who are dead. I mean, he's already done everything that must be done and concluded all transactions from Adam to himself. All of that. And so for those who did not have the chance, he gave them the chance. But after he had died and resurrected and has offered himself, there's nothing beyond Jesus. So if you don't believe in him, there's nothing, there's nothing more. There's no one else to make any sacrifice for anyone. So I believe that the death of Jesus Christ dealt with <clears throat> everything that had occurred in the form of sin from Adam to his time. Matthew chapter 28, verse 2, I'm going to read, says, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. How important is this incident in confirming the authenticity of the resurrection? Um, I mean, the stone was an obstacle for, for everybody. I mean, the, the, the Jews had placed it there, and then the Romans uh, had authorized for, for protection, and it had a seal. So from, from a Jewish point of view, from a Roman point of view, nobody could touch it and go free. Uh, so that, that's, that's it. And from the testimony of the women, it would seem as if uh, it was quite a, a heavy stone, but possible to roll away because they asked who will roll the stone. If they asked that, it, it meant that maybe some people strong enough could roll the stone. After all, human beings put the stone there, human beings could 
could roll it away. But the difficulty would be uh, who would have the authority to roll away the stone? Uh, the Jews and the Romans say we can't, and we still want to go and anoint his body. Who, will roll, who, who has the power? Who, who can authorize that? Uh, and, and God authorized it himself. And an angel from heaven uh, came and broke Jewish protocol and Roman protocol and rolled away the stone. So it was a question of authorization. I believe it was, it was a physical questing, who can physically do it, but authorization was also very important because you can't just go and undo what uh, a Roman system had sealed. I mean, you couldn't do that. You need uh, somebody like Joseph of Arimathea or some other important disciple to get the authorization for the stone to be removed. Um, but the removal of the stone was not for Jesus to get out. Jesus resurrected out of the grave through the closed door. The removal of the stone was for us to see what had happened in the grave. Because without the removal of the stone, the evidence of the resurrection will not be there. So Jesus didn't need a stone rolled away for him to resurrect. The removal of the stone was for the evidence of the resurrection. If you just join us, you are watching Time with Pastor Otabel discussing today the Easter story with specific emphasis from his death through to his ascension. We shall take a short break. When we return, Dr. Otabel will explain the lingering doubts of the resurrection by the Jews. Please stay tuned. Welcome back from the break. If you are watching us on Facebook, please tell us where you are watching us from and what God is doing in your life. Please keep your comments coming throughout the entire broadcast. If you are also watching us on television and you have questions for Dr. Otterbell's attention, please send it to the number on the screen. That's Eric. All right. Doc, there have been several instances where Jesus physically appeared with, to his disciples and other people. Why is it the Jews to have a lingering doubt about this resurrection? It was not to the advantage of the Jewish leadership for the idea and the reality of the resurrection to be accepted. Uh, because then it overthrows the entirety of everything they were holding. And uh, the gospel accounts say that they... they we're very determined to ensure that that fact never comes out. And they actually had to influence people to tell a different narrative. No matter how inconsistent that narrative was, it was told. Um, but it's also important to note that the early disciples of Jesus were all Jews. They believed in him even before he died. And believed in him more after he died and resurrected. And the first disciples, the preaching of the gospel on the day of Pentecost was all to Jewish people. So in as much as people try to stop that belief, it gained currency. And we, we see that in the book of Acts, that large numbers, including people in the priesthood, the Jewish priesthood, uh, were turning to, to Christ. So as much as they tried to stifle that message, it still gained uh, a lot of acceptance and, and many people uh, believed in it. And remember, these were first-hand participants of the story at that time. Uh, the day of Pentecost is just about uh, 50 days after the events of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And if 50 days after his death and resurrection, 3,000 people would believe that Jesus is alive. I mean, when these stories are very contemporary, 
It just tells you that although they tried to keep the story quiet, uh, it didn't go quiet. People, many people believed that Jesus Christ had resurrected. But the Bible says in John chapter 20, verse 25, that Thomas insisted that unless he experienced and touched the resurrected Christ, he would not believe the resurrection. Is it wrong for a Christian to ask for empirical evidence to believe? Well, I mean, I, I think Thomas uh, shows us that Christianity is not fantasy. I mean, the, in every society, there are people who are hyper. They believe everything. And then there are people who are critical and skeptical. They all question everything. I mean, every society has it. Uh, and, and so we see right there from Christianity that um, where you have Peter, who believes Jesus is the son of God long ago, uh, who believes the testimony of the women that Jesus has resurrected uh, and doesn't question it. He runs to go and look for it. There is Thomas, <laughs> who is uh, a bit skeptical and says, you know, you can't just tell me these stories. I, I want to see it myself and not just see, I want to touch it. I want the physical proof. And, and so sometimes we all need a Thomas uh, who helps to bring clarity to our doubts. I mean, people call him the doubting Thomas. And in a sense, yes, Jesus rebuked him and says, blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. And, and that is a blessed state. But Jesus offered him the proof. If Jesus thought offering proof was negative, he would have said, who am I to show up to Thomas? Believe it or leave. But Jesus offered him the proof. And, and, and these are important things for our Christian faith that God does not um, shun proof. It doesn't mean that should be how we come to faith because the thing about human beings is you can give them all the proof and still they wouldn't, they wouldn't believe. You know, Thomas could still have uh, touched Jesus and said, I, I still don't think it's true. But he believed. Uh, so much as physical proof is important, believing without physical proof is preferred. But doesn't God sometimes deal with us that way? Occasionally, there's a physical proof of something. I believe that is why God does things for us. You know, um, every Christian has moments of doubt and then moments of faith. And the moments of doubt, maybe you pray for something for a long time and it's not coming and you're not seeing it and you're wondering, you know, is God, uh, you're wondering all these things about God. And then there are things you pray for and they just happen and it affirms your faith. And then you go through your own moments of doubt and then moments of faith and moments of doubt and moments of faith. I feel all of this is designed for us to trust God and to depend on him and to yield to him. And that's, that's what I see from, from the Thomas story. Still talking about the resurrected Jesus in John chapter 20, verse 22, he appeared to his disciples. He breathed upon them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. How different is this from the Holy Spirit they received on the day of Pentecost? I believe there are two activities of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in the life of a believer. There, there's the Holy Spirit taking residence in us. That is when we say Christ has come to live in our hearts. I mean, when a person says, I've received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, in reality, they've received the Holy Spirit uh, because the Holy Spirit is also the Spirit of Christ to come and live inside of them. I think that is a, a work of God. And then there is the Holy Spirit empowering us to do the work of God. And so we see the John account talking about the residence of the Holy Spirit in the believers, and then the Acts account talking about the empowering of the believers to do the works of Christ. Now, empowering is for every believer. I believe that every believer who has Christ living in him or her uh, 
can be empowered or should be or is empowered by the Holy Spirit. I believe that people have to actively desire for the Holy Spirit to empower them uh, for, for the work that he's called them. But if you don't desire, it's going to be automatic. I, I believe just like salvation has to be desired and asked for, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit also has to be desired and asked for. Jesus' last instruction to the disciples was to go in, was the Great Commission. But there are some who have the argument that the, the sparring of the mega churches is not a, a, does not conform to what Jesus asked them to do. I, I think, um, you know, sometimes we become very uh, limited in the way we see some of these ideas in the Bible. Uh, so when, for example, somebody says, go to the world to preach, then they expect that you physically move from one location to another location to another location to another location. Um, but when a person is on television and people are hearing him, he's going to the world. When a person is using social media to preach, he's going into the world. Uh, when you write a book and people read it, you've gone into the world. So going into the world does not always entail physically moving from your location to another location. Sometimes it is the ministry you have that moves, the words you have, the, the declaration you have. After all, how do we have the word of God come to us? It came to us through the Bible. You know, and, and the work of the apostles have traveled for 2,000 years to us. But how did it happen? Because they recorded their story and we read it. And they've gone into the world. They've come to us. But I haven't seen Peter come to me or, or John come to me. But their words have come to me. The words of Paul have come to me. Similarly, our words go to people. And yes, it's okay to go into people's homes and preach and, and travel outside to preach. But we are getting to a point where God has afforded us so much to reach the world with. And if we use them, uh, so many will be saved. What we, we forget when we read a great commission, uh, Jesus says, go into all the world, disciple, preach the gospel, disciple nations, disciple nations. It's not just about preaching. It's about creating a Christian community that thrives on the word of God, that grows in the word of God, that grows in fellowship with one another. And yes, it can happen in a mega church and it can happen in a small church as well. Um, if a church is 10 people who gather, that's fine. Jesus says where two or three are gathered, he is present. If the church is 10,000, that's fine too. If the church is 100,000, that's fine too. In fact, the larger church is showing how much they have reached out to people uh, with the gospel of Christ. But I think that the concept of mega churches itself is an evangelistic message. It's a system that people have to, maybe later we have to have a discussion on, on that. Uh, but we, we have to understand the church transformation over the years uh, from, from the early church. The early church was mainly made up of home groups, small groups, but the small groups were all networked. So they, they, you call them cell groups today. You know, they're networked small groups all over. And because at that time, there was only one organization for the church. There, there were more than one organization, it's everything. So the church would be the church in a city. And the church in a city met in different locations. And there would be probably the head of the church in the city and, and the different people who met uh, in the locations. But the church has moved organizationally from that because it's, it's an organizational development. And, and so people have to take into note that part of it is a spiritual reality. The other is a socio uh, cultural development of a group, an organization that is now finding expression in different ways. And, and both are relevant, and we have to, we, we have to examine both.
Doc, there seems to be a lack of theological appreciation over the significance of Easter to a modern day Christian. What do we do to preserve this heritage since it's fundamental to our faith? Uh, part of what we are doing, talking about it, um, uh, making people aware, uh, doing church events during Easter, and explaining. I, I, I think we need a lot of explanation for our faith and not just encouragement of miracles for people and breakthroughs for people and, and, and the things we do. They are all important. But I'm seeing that more and more Christianity, especially in our part of the world, is becoming uh, focused on the needs of the people and not necessarily the growth of the people. Um, and, and whilst we meet the needs of the people, we must also ensure the growth of the people and the deepening of their conviction so that a Christian is not swayed by every other thing that happens in the world. Christians must be very resilient in their faith and must know their faith very, very well and the foundations of their faith and understand it very thoroughly so they can appreciate uh, how it affects their life and how they manifest it. Whilst we seek to meet the needs of the people, we should be particularly interested in their growth. Thank you so much, Dr. Otabel. We have come to another session of an interesting discussion. Pastor Eric, thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you very much. Pastor Priscilla, thank you so much for You're welcome. your contribution. Dr. Otabel, we are already in the Easter season. What will be your Easter message to the world? And we'll have a prayer in addition. Okay. I mean, I, I think today's um, discussion has been very uh, stimulating uh, for me intellectually uh, because we've really examined some difficult passages and, and scriptures. And, and it's good that we do that so that we don't sugarcoat our faith and leave the hard things alone and just do the very easy thing. So I'm, I'm glad for the questions that have come uh, around the, the table today. And, and for you, I hope that you've been blessed by it and I hope that your faith is enriched. And uh, as we approach Good Friday and Holy Saturday and Easter, uh, we trust God that Christ will be real to us, that as we go through the days, the things we are learning or the things we've heard will inform how we appreciate the reality of each day, of, of a Good Friday, of a Holy Saturday, of Easter, and, and how we live out our Christian lives in all that we do. And uh, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I pray that you make him your Lord and Savior. I'm going to lead everybody to pray the prayer uh, of faith, the believer's prayer, to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. And you, you will pray that prayer with me. Say with me, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I come to you today. I come to you today. Just as I am. Just as I am. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. That Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ. Died for me. Died for me. On the cross of Calvary. On the cross of Calvary. He paid. He paid. For my sins. For my sins. Fully. Fully. And today, and today, I receive, I receive forgiveness, forgiveness from, sin. from sin. I ask you, Father, I ask you, Father, make me a new person. Make me a new person. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. Change my life. Change my life. Make me your child. Make me your child. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father, for accepting me. For accepting me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.